Okay, let's begin. Welcome to the International Septed Association webinar on all issues related to crime prevention through environmental design. The International Septed Association, the ICA, is a worldwide non-profit association for professionals, researchers, urban designers, crime prevention practitioners, and students of septed. Our webinar is intended to educate and extend the septed message into topics far and wide. This webinar is produced by the ICA, and the introductory music was kindly prepared for us by the Denver-based band, Moosh. My name is Dr. Manjari Khanna Kapoor, I'm a director at ICA and the coordinator of the ICA webinar committee. I welcome you all to our webinar today. Before we start, I would like to invite you to join the ICA if you're not already a member. Become a member of our international professional organization. Also a brief disclaimer that the views expressed in this presentation belong to our guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the position of the ICA. I will now hand over to our Executive Director, Mateya Mihinyak, who will moderate today's webinar to introduce the topic and today's panelists. Over to you, Mateya, and have a great session for all of you. Thank you very much, Manjari. So a very warm welcome to everyone, who, to everyone who joined us for today's webinar on the topic of NGOs and SEPTED, challenges and possibilities, organizing partnership with the Safer Sweden Foundation. So because not everyone might be familiar with the NGOs, and because the role of NGOs might be different in different parts of the world, I'd like to say a couple of sentences about NGOs within the context of today's webinar. An NGO or non-governmental organization is a nonprofit group that functions independently of the government. NGOs play an important role in civil society. They often have a philanthropic, social cause, or research purpose. They often act as think tanks that aim to influence public policy. Our speakers today come from the Safer Sweden Foundation, a Swedish NGO that is politically and religiously independent, does not take any state subsidy, and operates as a nonprofit organization. Its main function is to improve crime victim support and to promote the development in the area of crime pre prevention while also collaborating with other organizations. Today, our guests will present the work of their organization specifically as it relates to their work with SEPTEC. So as you may know, we welcome the Safer Sweden Foundation to the ICA family as the first European chapter under the ICA umbrella initiative that we launched in April last year. The purpose of this initiative is establishing a network of septet related organizations throughout the world and build connections between them while honoring the diversity of those organizations and the context in which they operate. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's panelists and I invite all the panelists to uh, show their pretty faces today. Um, so um, our first panelist is Dr. Magnus Lindgren. Uh, Magnus is a psychologist, criminologist, and former police officer and police chief. Magnus is a secretary general at the Safer Sweden Foundation. Today, Magnus will talk about the role of the Safer Sweden Foundation as an NGO that works with SEPTED from a more strategic point of view. So welcome, Magnus. Thank you for being here. Um, then our second, <laughs> thank you, Magnus. Our second presenter today is Marika Haug. Uh, she's an analyst and criminologist at the Safer Sweden Foundation, and Marika will talk about her work on Safer Schools and specifically about the tool that she's developed for schools in her role at the Safer Sweden Foundation. So welcome, Marika. And lastly, but not last but not least, we have Dr. Cornelis Ittenbogart, uh, who is a researcher and urban planner with a PhD in urban design in under, of underground stations. Today, Cornelis will talk about the standard and handbook both both Rickert uh, 2030 that he has developed at the Safer Sweden Foundation. And I'll let um, 
uh, Cornelis uh, pronounced that correctly later on. So welcome, Cornelis. Okay, uh, welcome to all three presenters. So we will start with Magnus. And while we let Magnus prepare to zoom in on the work of the Safer Sweden Foundation, I would like to ask all of our uh, participants or all of you, um, our uh, guests today, uh, to answer a couple of quick, quick questions on the poll that will pop up on your screen. So uh, please, I will launch the first poll, which asks, which sector do you work in? And please take a few seconds to answer that question. And in the meantime, I will also ask Magnus to maybe um, start introducing some of the points that he will make today and so on. Um, while we wait for these uh, responses to come in. So over to you, Magnus. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it says that I'm unable to start a video. I think you have to now. Okay, great, great. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you. So now, hello everyone. Uh, well, since it's uh, 10 o'clock in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, I say good morning to everyone, uh, even though it's not morning for all of you. Uh, my name is Magnus Lindgren, and I'm a researcher and a former uh, police officer and uh, chief of police. Uh, I'm also the founder and uh, secretary general of the Safer Sweden uh, Foundation. Uh, first, I want to thank Ika and uh, uh, Mandjari and Matea for hosting this seminar about NGOs and SEPTED. Uh, as uh, Matea said, it's an important topic uh, since uh, NGOs, uh, at least in Sweden, often is overlooked in crime prevention and the work with SEPTED and crime prevention. So uh, before my colleagues Marika and Cornelis will give some examples of how an NGO can work with SEPTED in practice, uh, I will give you a snapshot of Sweden and the situation and complication when it comes to crime and crime prevention. Uh, but first a few words about Safer Sweden Foundation and uh, I will be glad to ask uh, to, to answer questions if you have during the, the uh, course of action here. I will share my screen here now and hope that it will work. Um, so. mm -hmm. Also see the answers for the poll here uh, that uh, about half of the participants have some uh, experiences with uh, uh, collaboration with NGOs in the work. So, uh, and, and that means that half of, of, of the listeners are not having that. So uh, just a few words here about the Safer Sweden Foundation. Uh, 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 as Matea said, we are uh, um, organized as a foundation. Uh, we are a prof professional NGO, uh, a nonprofit. Uh, the organization was established in 2008. And right now we have offices here in Stockholm, where I'm uh, sitting right now, and also in Gothenburg, where Cornelis uh, is and in Malmö in the southern part of Sweden. Uh, NGOs often struggles with uh, the financing, of course, and uh, so are we. We have uh, our finance throughout a cooperation with different companies. We work uh, with different companies uh, from a uh, social uh, responsibility uh, point of view and we also have our own non-profit consulting businesses where we help uh, municipalities, uh, we help different companies to develop uh, their work with crime prevention and, and the dealing with victims of crime. Uh, 
the mission uh, for, say, for Sweden is to, oops, uh, the mission is to protect and to extend the legal rights of crime victims and also develop, I don't know what's happening here, I'm sorry, it's, it's changing. Uh, um, uh, um, also to work to, to, to develop crime prevention initiatives. Uh, we are working to influence public opinion on these issues and also uh, working together with uh, politicians from different parties uh, in, in Sweden. And the work is aimed at uh, uh, convincing a new uh, ideas, devising new forms of cooperations and come with new solutions in the field of public safety and security. The goal is to reduce crime and to ensure that all crime victims are given appropriate and assistance, support and uh, uh, protection. Now, and uh, the values all is that all any work done within the framework of the foundation is uh, uh, is uh, based on research and experiences and grounded in basic values laid down in the uh, UN and EU conventions on human rights and the international documents relating to right of uh, victims of crime and crime prevention. And the vision is that Sweden will continue to be one of the safest countries in the world uh, to visit, work and live in. I have to stop uh, sharing here and try to see what's uh, wrong with the, with the presentation since it's uh, just moving along all the way. So uh, Marika, do you know what's... Uh... Alltså det kan ju bero på ifall det har någon typ av effekt. Nej, jag har ingen effekt. Då vet jag inte vad det beror på. presentationen nu? Nej, men kan du inte ropa på Jakob så kan han hjälpa dig. Göra det. Annars får du köra bara. Det är ja. nog bättre att du bara kör. Ja. So, uh, I will skip my slides since I have some problems with the slides. Uh, we, we can just... Um, um, uh, I will just talk and, and try to do it from, from, from that. Uh, so... Um, just a few words about Sweden for uh, those of you who hasn't been here. Uh, Sweden has about uh, 10.4 million inhabitants of which 41% live in urban environments. So Sweden is just a rural country with a low population density. And uh, we have only four cities within, uh, with more than 200,000 inhabitants, and that's Stockholm, and it's Gothenburg, Malmö, and Uppsala. Uh, another, uh, I think for this discussion, important information is that for almost 50 years in a row, between 1932 and until 1976, and period since then for the last uh, seven years, for example, and all in all 72 of the last 90 years, Sweden has been ruled by one party, by the Swedish Social Democrat Party. And uh, I mean, since we have had one party that have governed Sweden for 72 of the last 90 years that have of course, shaped our world view for good and for bad. And uh, also Sweden is in many ways, of course, a fantastic country with, with great freedom, with, with equality and, and uh, for many years also low crime. However, in recent years, the possibility to create and maintain safe neighborhoods for citizens and companies have been 
increasingly and dramatically challenge. So that's the situation in, in, in Sweden uh, right now, if we discuss the situation. Um, so in, in, in many ways, uh, and I think it's important for you to, to, to realize that uh, we have a new situation in our country and you might have heard about it in, 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 in the media. So changing demographic, increased drug abuse, poorly maintained public spaces are some of these challenges that we have in our country right now. In addition, the, there are great challenges such as increasingly organized crimes, even in smaller cities. Uh, uh, and uh, the situation in uh, several of our suburban areas is grim with riots. We have parallel structures, gangs, or even clans that have come to fill the vacuum that arose from the absence of a local police, as well as the municipalities' lack of ability to deal with or implement crime prevention procedures that are knowledge and informa information based. So both, uh, I should say, the police and municipalities in our country are struggling right now to, to get a grip of this uh, new situation with, with the crime and uh, unsafety. And in some district, the, about 60 uh, areas in Sweden, the situation has gone so far as to the point where the police and emergency service sometimes cannot enter these areas without heavy backup and reinforcement. And, and that's in our country up here in the north, uh, where we have a, had a very calm and low crime rate for many, many years. So it's, it's really a new situation when it comes to crimes. Um, and another thing that might be interesting for you to know, uh, that's the, 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 the general perception of the Swedish uh, people, the Swedish public, however, seems to be that the, the situation is in Sweden is representative for the situation in the rest of Europe. Although other, many other countries also find themselves uh, facing big challenges in, in Europe, uh, the truth is that Sweden currently is not normal in this regard. In fact, it, it's quite the opposite. Sweden differs from the situation in many other European countries uh, right now when it comes to crime. For example, uh, we work in the Netherlands every now and then and have a lot of contacts in the Netherlands. Uh, in Netherlands, there are no districts or areas where the police or emergency service cannot enter without heavy backup, as in our country. When we compare uh, this situation in Sweden to, to Germany, for example, uh, we can notice that there are more young people that are shot and killed in Sweden than in Germany. And uh, when I talk to my and our colleagues in, in, in Italy, for example, about the situation in, in some of our rural areas, with the, uh, we have a lot of cars that are put on fire. Uh, the Italians say, well, we don't have that in, to that extent. So in many ways, um, uh, we are a unique country. Uh, with a unique uh, perception about ourselves since for one reason we had the same party that that uh, was running the country for 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 almost 50 years and uh, we have a view over ourselves that is maybe not uh, always uh, <laughs> uh, true and uh, so a relevant question is, of course, uh, how Sweden has ended up in such a situation with, with crime and with this new situation with more organized crime. Is it a coincidence or is it the bad luck or uh, what is it? 
Well, um, I should say one answer to this uh, question is that is, uh, uh, this situation is self-inflicted where we can see actually a number of uh, policy decisions or event or more or less tipping points in the last 50 years that uh, have paved the, the way for where we are today in Sweden. And I think that some of these are irrelevant for this discussion that we will have today about NGOs and SEPTED. And one uh, reason or one tipping point that has contributed to the current situation in many Swedish cities is actually the design, the design of cities and uh, residential areas from 1960s and, and forward that uh, in some ways created preconditions for crime and unsafety to, to be partly built into the uh, environments. I mean, instead of building areas with a, a variety of functions in small scale and with national meeting places uh, during 1960s and 70s uh, in our country, as in many other countries, we built a lot of new areas uh, in a short period of times. And uh, during this time, we built in a way that you live in one area and you work in another and, and, and you go shopping in a third. Um, and at the same time, the boundaries separating public goods from private goods started to erode. And so one reason for this new situation we have in Sweden is actually how we have built our cities uh, and the million program and and uh, uh, the problems that we actually have in a lot of these areas right now. So another tipping point that has contributed to the situation that we have right now in, in Sweden is uh, uh, the police. Um, in 1965, almost uh, at the same time, we started to build in a new way in our country and in many other countries as well. We, we nationalized the police. So before the nationalization, we had about uh, uh, police chief jurisdictions in 500 different places with posting in 1000 different places. But after this reorganization took place, we have only, uh, we have gone from uh, uh, police postings in 1000 different places to police postings in 100 places. Uh, so this means when we start to build in a new way, at the same time, the police started to leave the municipalities. So in many ways, we lack a local uh, police in many cities today. So here we have two tipping points that actually has contributed to the current situation in Sweden. Both the way we uh, built our cities in the 1960s and 70s, and also the fact that, that the police have started to, to leave the municipalities in the, in the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, uh, a third tipping point took place in Sweden in the late 1980s, and that's where, when we had the more organized crime established in our country. And uh, that was the gangs, uh, in, primarily and mainly motorcycle gangs that took hold of the region of Skåne in the southern part of, of, of Sweden. And uh, since then, uh, we have about 10,000 uh, motorcycle uh, uh, 
people uh, connected to mo motorcycle gangs in Sweden today. Uh, so that's another tipping point. Uh, a fourth tipping point that has contributed to the current situation is the situation uh, with drugs in Sweden. Uh, uh, and the situation is quite severe right now, as in, of course, many other countries. Uh, despite Sweden have declared war on drugs long time ago, the police and municipalities right now report that in many places that there are currently more drugs than ever before in our country. Uh, on top of that, uh, I record high number of Swedes die from drugs overdoses and the number of drug related death per capita is the second highest in the EU. So we have right now uh, uh, big problems with, with the drug situation and in connecting to that, uh, the organized crime. So presently, many of the fatal shootings and dr are uh, drug related. Uh, and to give some uh, um, uh, heads up for, 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 for Cornelis here now and Marika that will talk about how an NGO can work with SEPTED, uh, a fifth uh, um, tipping point is uh, actually uh, um, how um, um, we have been working with crime prevention in our country. Uh, until 2015, we mainly, almost all only talked about social prevention in our country. So for, for decades, the, the perception in Sweden has been that the only way to prevent crime is to try to get more nicer people and to, to, to get people to behave. And so a one-sided focus on social prevention. And as an NGO, uh, we have been working since 2008 to try to convince both the public and politicians that it's very important also to work with situational prevention. And uh, we have tried to lift the importance of SEPTED in, in crime prevention work. And uh, we feel that since 2015, it has been a change in the uh, general uh, perception of crime prevention work here in Sweden. And uh, um, I shouldn't say all, but a lot of focus is right now on SEPTED. So uh, it's therefore we are also very glad for this cooperation with ICA uh, and, and, and uh, think that we can do a lot of good things uh, together to further enhance uh, the situational prevention in Sweden because we, we need more of that uh, in our country. So I think that's it. I've been talking for 20 minutes and we have about five, 10 minutes to, to uh, maybe address some questions before my colleagues Marie and Cornelis start and uh, explain more in practice how we try to work with SEPTED in connection to schools and in connections to uh, uh, municipalities and buildings. So thank you, Matea. Excellent. Thank you so much, Magnus. That was uh, very interesting. Um, and since you kind of ended on on, the, on a note on influencing public policy, um, that's actually the question I wanted to ask you about. I mean, you said there's increased um, interest in SEPTA across the country. So, you as an NGO, how are you able maybe to ensure that there's you know, proper knowledge being disseminated through maybe your NGO and maybe other organizations about SEPTED so that you know, the, that knowledge is um, first disseminated and then retained within the organizations and so on. So how do you see your role in doing that? 
Well, that's a good question. Uh, we try to arrange the seminars all the time, free seminars for, for uh, people working within the police and municipalities and also uh, property owners. We work together with a lot of property owners. We also arrange uh, uh, field visits and trips. So uh, every year, not last year and this year, of course, but uh, otherwise we have been um, uh, traveling at least three, four times a year to Vienna, to Amsterdam, to London, to New York, to see how other countries, other cities work with crime prevention, uh, together with NGOs and municipalities and the police and property owners. But uh, also in, in our country, I think it's important for you to realize that until uh, 2008, uh, uh, in our country, we all only talked about the police. It was the police that uh, should solve everything and some more. And between 2008 and 2015, we have only been talking about the police and the municipalities that in co cooperation should be able to prevent work. But we have been, we have tried since 2008 to talk about two other important stakeholders as well. And that's the, uh, besides the police and the municipalities, we have been trying to enhance the, the uh, yeah, businesses, companies, it's important to involve uh, uh, property owners and security companies and also uh, NGOs. So we, we enhance the importance of these four different stakeholders to be able to, to prevent crime. And uh, so, so, different seminars, field trips, and so on. That's our way, and also discussions, of course, with politicians and people. Mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. And maybe as a follow-up to that question, um, could you maybe say how we can approach uh, those type of organizations? Because if we kind of look at the uh, the responses from the post we launched at the start. Mm. Um, about half of people said they have collaborated with NGOs and 55% uh, of respondents said that they come from private sector, 50 from public sector. So those are kind of probably your, almost like your target audiences or at least one of the actors or um, you know potential partners you could uh, connect with. So how can you as an NGO approach those potential partners or stakeholders? to collaborate uh, via SEPTA and other means? Well, of course, uh, Marika and Cornelis will talk more about that in, in practice, but uh, uh, um, we have realized during these last 13 years that for us, it has been important to, to have these discussions with property owners and, and different uh, security companies and actually, uh, arrange these trips to New York and uh, on place uh, show how you can work with uh, BIDs, for example, to be able to, 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 to prevent crimes. So uh, I, I, I think it's, it's important to arrange these kind of discussions and, and field trips and, and, and that's, the, that's the way to do it, I think. Uh, Mm -hmm. So establishing connections and basically starting talking, <laughs> uh, that's the key part. And by BID, I assume you meant business improvement districts, correct? Yeah. yeah. Just so the audience knows, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, maybe we can take one more question um, from the audience. Um, so, for example, Francesc, um, our colleague from... Catalonia said that as far as he knows, SEPTES is not only about situation crime prevention. So I know you mentioned earlier that, you know, SEPTES kind of quit situation crime prevention. Um, what would, would be your comment um, to that question or comment rather? Well, uh, of course, that's right. And I think that uh, we are in, in somehow in Sweden, we are world champions when it comes to social prevention. So, so you are welcome to, to Sweden if you want to. To have a uh, to, to see how we have been working for the last 50 years with social prevention but i think we have a lot of learn so so what's important for us is that part of septed uh, 
uh, we have already like the social prevention part of SEPTED implemented uh, in in every way, up and downs and silos uh, here in, in our country. So maybe it's that's why I lifted the, the especially the, the situational prevention part of it. Okay. okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, Francesc said, uh, yes, I understand your perspective. Thank you. Um, sorry for, for the presentation. I don't know what happened, but I can send it to everyone. And you know. Yeah, thank you. That's what I wanted to suggest. But I think, I mean, you, I, I actually enjoyed uh, listening to you <laughs> even without the slides, Magnus. So I think that was uh, well presented. So, um, but we can definitely share the slides with everyone if you're okay with that at the end. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay, so I suggest we move um, to our other two presenters and save some more questions for the end. Um, do please ask questions as, um, as you think of them in the, comment, in the chat box or Q&A box. Um, but for now, I would like to hand over to Marika. So uh, Marika will present a practical example of the Safer Schools tool that she's developed. Um, so over to you, Marika. Thank you. So thank you. I hope that you can see my presentation and that you can hear me properly. Uh, so like Matea said, my name is Marika Haug. It's very nice to meet you in this context. Mm, and I have been working for the Safer Sweden Foundation for the last five years and always with a specific focus on school and school prevention. So that's one of our work areas and I'm responsible for that work area. So I will briefly describe how we work with schools and how, uh, what kind of perspectives we have in that school, in that uh, uh, context. Uh, so one important question is of course, why we focus on school, why we have that as a specific work area. Uh, and to give you some uh, examples of why, uh, we have a national survey that goes out every second year uh, that is organized by the government. Uh, to 15 year olds in Sweden. And this survey shows every year that almost half of the uh, 15 year olds in Sweden have been victimized during the last 12 months. And this survey uh, asks questions about all kinds of different types of crimes like theft, uh, burglary, uh, robbery, um, physical assault, sexual assault, and so on. Um, and what's interesting with this survey is also that it asks questions of, about where the uh, child has been victimized. And what this survey shows is that schools in Sweden are one of the most common places for crime. And for what, some types of crimes, it's the most common place. Uh, so this is something that is quite interesting from our perspective, because uh, apart from that we know that working with children can prevent crimes further on. We also know that now that uh, schools are one of the hotspots for crimes for young people. We also know that these can have some long-term and short-term effects, negative effects for the individual and for society. Uh, so this is something that we uh, have as a foundation when we work. Uh, and this is why we think that it's very important to actually focus on school, to see how we can make sure that schools are safe uh, and a place where children can thrive and feel well and not go to school with uh, having stomach aches in the morning. Uh, so like Magnus said, we work on different kind of levels. Uh, so when it comes to school, we work both on a national level and also on a local level. So the purpose with our work is always to make sure that schools are safe places. But we have different goals on the national and local level. And I wanted to give you some examples to see, to make uh, you see how this kind of works. So for example, like Magnus said, we have had a huge focus on social prevention in Sweden. And this means that we have focused a lot on the perpetrator when dealing with crime prevention. And we have not focused so much on the crime victim. And we have not focused on situational prevention. 
Uh, so one thing, uh, one goal on a national level is actually to change the attitude towards victimization in schools. Often we don't talk about victimization in schools as children being victims of crimes. We talk about uh, this kind of victimization as uh, children being victims of bullying or that it's something that just, just a conflict that arises between two children. So this is something that we work very hard to change, to actually put the victim uh, in focus. Uh, on a local level, this could mean that we work to secure children's rights in local contexts. Uh, but something that is also interesting with us working on a national level and a local level is that these kind of goals or this work influence each other. Uh, so, for example, on a national level, we can create, try to work to create better preconditions for crime prevention in schools. But on a local level, when we work, we map obstacles for crime prevention in schools. And the obstacles that we identify on a local level is something that we use uh, as a foundation on a national level to see how we can uh, reduce these obstacles. Uh, on a national level, we also work on a theoretical level, more or less. And on a lo local level, we work on a practical level to see how the knowledge that we uh, provide on a national level, how we can use that on a local level. Uh, and these are some examples of what we have done when it comes to publications. Uh, so Matea mentioned the toolkit Safer Schools, uh, and that is this one, if you can see my cursor. Uh, so this is the toolkit safe for schools and the toolkit is about how how uh, schools and municipalities can systematize their crime preventive work. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more about that later on. Uh, and this is a report showing how schools and municipalities can work with situational crime prevention in uh, schools and how they can collaborate with other actors. Uh, and I also wanted to uh, show you this book. Uh, and if you translate this title, it says, Grab Your Child and Run. And that title is from a, a quote from a police officer that was consulted by a friend, a parent who had a child who was victimized in school. Uh, and the parent asked what they could do uh, to uh, protect the child. And the police said, grab your child and run. Uh, and the point being was that society can't help you or your child. And I wanted to uh, highlight this book because this also goes back to what Magnus said in the beginning about us being a crime victim organization in the foundation. Um, because in our work, we always have a crime victim focus and that's very important for us. Um, so I will show you some examples of what this means in our work. So these are some stories that children have told me when I've been working with schools. Um, so this is a quote from a girl who said that a girl showed me a knife in school and said that she would stab me if I came back the next day. I went to the school counselor and told her, but she just told me to let it go. And the students said that how could she sleep that night because she didn't know if the girl was serious or not. A quote from another student is, the staff tells someone to quit, but then they just walk away. There are no consequences and they don't call any parents either. And this, I would say, is something that I hear from students in probably like 80 or 90 percent of the schools that I work with. So it's very common in Sweden. And this story is from a girl who was victimized by a boy in her school and he was expelled, but he came back to school after a couple of weeks. And she said this, that when he came back, he tried to strangle me. They didn't offer more than a meeting with a school counselor. But after I broke down completely, an extra teacher saw it and she became furious and started investigations and the social service and everything was shitty. But if she hadn't done that, I would have tried to kill myself so I wouldn't have to go back to school. So the school should be able to deal with the situation better. Um, and I also added a quote that might be interesting from a separate perspective because it highlights the importance of management. Uh, and it is that there are a lot of graffiti in the restrooms. Look what it says here. Why should I go to school when I could feel just as bad by lighting myself on fire? So the reason why I wanted to just mention this is that it uh, highlights that we work in different 
kind of ways when we work with schools. So we work uh, with looking at the physical environment uh, to see how the physical environment can help reduce crimes. But we also look uh, at schools from a crime victim perspective. How good is the school at handling uh, victimization? What kind of support does the school offer to students? And we also look in a broader sense on an organizational level to see how schools organize their crime preventive work. Uh, which kind of preconditions are there? Which kind of obstacles are there uh, to help the school to actually structure their crime preventive work? Uh, so we don't, when it comes to school, we don't only work with the physical environment. Um, and I mentioned previously that the toolkit uh, Safer Schools is about helping municipalities and schools to systematize their crime prevention. Um, and I will show you uh, a model of how our process look like. Uh, so this is something that we try to help schools to do. And what we find is important when someone is working with crime prevention is first to define concepts, because if we don't do that, we don't really know what we're working with. And people often talk about different things. And the second step is to map the situation on a school and then to identify causes and then to de define and implement measures and then to evaluate and follow up. And I'm sure that a lot of you are familiar with this kind of process and the kind of steps that you need to do when you work with crime prevention. When I look at schools in Sweden, I would say that uh, what they are good at is are these two steps. So uh, I would say that almost all of the schools in Sweden map the situation in different kind of ways, but the quality of that is not always very good uh, because it can be, uh, the school can have uh, arranged like a group discussion with students and then the school assumes that the students are comfortable with expressing themselves in front of a group when it deals with kind of sensitive questions. So the quality is not always very good, but then the schools every year define and implement measures to prevent crime in schools. But since those measures aren't always based on an analyze uh, or on a good um, data or anything like that, we don't really know what kind of measures or what kind of effect these measures should have. Uh, and I would say that uh, almost all schools are uh, kind of uh, uh, are not really evaluating or following up, even though they should. Uh, they are not evaluating or following up the results. So even though we have the preconditions to actually know what works and what doesn't work in Swedish uh, Swedish schools, because we are putting a lot of time, energy, resources, money on this kind of work, we don't always know what's, what works and what doesn't because we don't follow up. Uh, so this is something that we try to help schools to do and we try to educate schools and municipalities to actually work uh, through this process. And we can go into different projects to help the schools or the municipalities in a broader way. But I would say that most of the times we are consulted to work with mapping the situation on a specific school. Uh, and if we look at how we do that, uh, this is also um, this is also described in the toolkit safer schools. So this is something that we are trying to help municipalities to help schools to uh, do on their own. But if we look at how we map the situation on a school, we look at statistics, we conduct interviews with school staff and other important stakeholders. Uh, we conduct student dialogues, we go through policy documents to see how the school organized their crime preventive work as for today, and we also uh, make inspections of their physical environment. Um, so the student dialogues is something that we put a lot of time and effort in, um, and for us it's very important to have a representative dialogue that is inclusive. So we are offering the students different kind of tools, different kind of methods to actually express themselves. Um, because we know that some people are uh, comfortable with expressing themselves in front of a group. Some people want to talk one-on-one. -on -one. Some people want to write letters. Uh, some people are comfortable with expressing themselves in more creative ways. So we offer the students different kind of ways to express themselves. And when we have done this, we get a picture when we go through uh, this mapping of the situation, 
we uh, get a good foundation for analyzing the causes of the problems uh, on a specific school. Uh, so I also wanted to show, I think I've gone past my time, but I also wanted to show some examples of how uh, the results from a student dialogue can look like. So this picture on the left, uh, this one uh, is a Lego structure built by 10 year olds. So they built their locker room because they wanted to show us that this door has a lock with a hole in it. So the boys, when they are uh, changing, they are changing in a locker room here. And then the boys usually go to the girls' locker room and then they peek through the hole here on the girls when they change their clothes. Uh, and this is a picture uh, drawn by a boy, an eight-year-old boy who wanted to tell us that people were being hit behind the sports hall in the school. Um, I also had some examples that I wanted to show from our work, but I think I will just write descriptions and I can share it afterwards with you so you can read about it, if that's fine. Because I think my time's up, Matea. <laughs> Uh, yeah, like if you're happy to finish and we uh, we can take the rest in our discussion and conversation, that's fine. Yeah, that's um, good. Yeah, okay. Maybe I would maybe, Marika, before you, before I hand over to Cornelis, um, this question is interesting. Um, and I don't know if there was a misunderstanding or something, but our colleague, uh, Janu Molnar from Hungary, uh, he said that according to his experience in social uh, crime prevention, they have um, an effect more easily on victims, but you, Marika, said that in Sweden you focus on the perpetrator. What kind of programs do you have to change the behavior of the perpetrators? So you could maybe just clarify that before we move on. Yeah, so Sweden is uh, high on uh, educating children. So in schools it can be value or normative changing programs, like programs against men's violence towards women, and then usually there is a lecturer who comes to the school and the person have a lecture with the children. And maybe that's a practical um, moment involved as well. Uh, there can also be education about drug prevention and so on. So a lot of what the schools often do, what they favor, and of course it's an educational institution, they favor education and that kind of prevention. Uh, but they also have programs that are more uh, structured uh, regarding specific types of crimes, like men's violence towards women. That's a common one. Uh, or normative changing programs. Um, but I would say that that's the main focus. But then also, if there's a child who has problems, there can be uh, involvement of the social services, helping that specific child. So it's also about working with specific individuals, I would say. Mm -hmm. Great. I Thank hope you. that answered the question. Yeah, and you know, if um, you would request some clarification or some follow-up, please um, leave them in the chat box. And uh, if you'd like also to have a question for someone um, specific in this um, panel, please do uh, also include their name uh, when you ask a question. Otherwise, uh, we'll ask whoever is um, willing to answer that question. So thank you very much, Marika. We'll get back to both you and Magnus. Um, but now I would like to um, give some time to Cornelis to present the handbook, Bot Trikrit uh, 2030, that he's developed at the Safer Sweden Foundation. So over to you, Cornelis, uh, please um, explain to us um, what the, this handbook is about and how it helps um, the work that you do. Um, I will ask you to show your camera as well and unmute yourself. You okay, Cornelis? Uh -huh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> it somehow jumped out. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. 
and we'll tell you a bit about how we work with mainly uh, urban development, um, but with a specific focus, of course, on our newly released handbook, which we released about a year ago, called uh, Bo 2030, or oh, Living Safe 2030. It has a focus on how urban planning and the built environment can help in creating the um, yeah, best possibilities for future places to be uh, perceived as safe, as well as to be uh, good in terms of crime prevention. Um, I will start with a bit of background here, which is about basically uh, why do we work with this yeah, focus on SEPTED in the built environment and how does it come in in policy implementation, both at the national level and local level. Um, I think this question is obvious for most of you here, of course, as you are most likely familiar, of course, uh, but also working with SEPTED. So I think you will not find the answer strange, um, but which might be surprising for some of you is that when it comes to urban planning in Sweden, we do not have uh, these terms crime prevention or feelings of safety as like, uh, yeah, how you, can you call it? Um, as like um, terms to be considered in the urban planning process. They're not automatically put up in the discussions. Um, it is more or less taken um, within the whole bigger picture of social sustainability, of course, or sustainability as a even larger picture when it comes to both environmental and economical sustainability. Um, we have seen a bit of a shift the last years, though, uh, especially when the, um, uh, yeah, the global sustainability goals came out, where there is a specific focus on the built environment in goal number 11 and the focus on safety as well. Um, so even here in Sweden, with the local implementation of this, uh, there has been a bit of a shift, but still we do lack uh, specific directives in the urban planning process when it comes to working with crime prevention and increasing feelings of safety. Um, so this has been for us a drive, uh, <laughs> yeah, a drive and focus the last yeah, decades to try to both increase knowledge at the national level and local level, like different private actors, municipal actors, etc., cetera, um, to open up the eyes of, uh, yeah, to how you can work with uh, crime prevention in urban planning and to also let them see that it does work. Um, we haven't achieved uh, the integration in the urban planning process yet, though I think due to, uh, as Magnus was uh, telling, due to different uh, lobbying activities from us and conferences, there is right now um, uh, a process ongoing where they are looking at the responsibility of municipalities when it comes to situation of crime prevention or crime prevention in general, where of course municipalities play a huge role when it comes to urban planning, especially in Sweden, where municipalities have like more or less, uh, how do you call it, <laughs> Monop monopoly position, uh, making the final decisions when it comes to all the urban planning and the usage of uh, uh, public spaces, of course, but basically any space within a municipality. So this is uh, kind of a huge investigation ongoing right now. Um, but we've also seen a shift when it comes to the governments and the National Agency for Planning. Um, I don't know the direct translation, but the Boerket, which is kind of the national um, yeah, agency for urban planning, you can say, uh, that they are also putting a bit more focus on this lately. Um, but when we look at cities, I think you all know that cities are important um, and there are different rankings. Um, and we can see here different rankings. Uh, those bigger cities ranked according to sustainability, if they are smart, livable, but also if they are safe. There have been done different research on this. Um, yet, we don't really see Stockholm in these rankings, not in the top 10. Um, we can see Stockholm uh, coming up at number 12 when it comes to safety, so that's not so bad, but we don't see it in the other rankings. But when we look which cities we can find in this top 10 here when it comes to safety, you see those five cities, Tokyo, Singapore, Sydney, Toronto, Copenhagen, and they also come back in those other 
uh, rankings. Um, so this is kind of a crucial thing, of course, for a city to be safe in order for this city to say, uh, later on develop, to be smarter, to be innovative and to be sustainable, like in the uh, overall picture. Um, but then when it comes to making change, what do we do? As I said, we try to lobby. Um, we see that there has been a progress when it comes to taking up uh, the, or at least discussing the topics of uh, safety and crime prevention when it comes to urban planning. Um, but when we look like nationally at our uh, planning and building act that we have here, uh, and we look up the terms of security uh, when it comes to crime or feeling of safety when it comes to crime or uh, public disorder, we can see that actually in the planning and building act, there is written the term uh, security. Um, in Swedish. Um, though when we dive deeper into the uh, law, we see that what they refer to is not uh, security connected to crime or public disorder. It's security connected to, for instance, um, um, traffic safety or uh, nature disasters, uh, like flooding, for instance, or uh, transport of um, dangerous goods or health risks. Uh, there's not any mention of uh, safety connected to or security connected to crime and public disorder. Uh, there is one paragraph or point that talks about municipalities, which can add um, different measures uh, to be implemented in detail plans that you can write in the detail plans uh, that you can you know, plan for working against certain disturbances. But even there, when we talk about disturbances in the law, it's mainly pointing at all disturbances from the surroundings in terms of um, um, yeah, annoying sounds or um, uh, sunlight that is not uh, really comfortable, or even health risks or uh, traffic, for instance, not anything directly connected to safety in terms of crime prevention um, or feeling uncomfortable when it comes to public disorder. Feeling of safety, uh, we can not at all find in the Planning and Building Act. We don't even see this term there at all. It is rather like um, incorporated in other terms as for instance, social sustainability, um, mental health, for instance. Of course, feeling of safety affects people's mental health. They might not be willing to go out, might not be willing to meet people, but it's not something that we can work with directly when we literally read the uh, Planning and Building Act. Um, so this, of course, makes it more difficult for um, practitioners or local actors to work with uh, safety connected to crime prevention when it's not directly written in the law. Um, and when it comes to local policy documents, we also see that there hasn't been a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of this, there has been some discussion, but it is not seldomly written into local policy documents yet. There come more and more, and I will show you a few examples here, where um, municipalities have been thinking about implementing these terms in local policy documents, but in general, it is uh, seldomly done yet. Um, for instance, we have Helsingborg, uh, the city, uh, where we see that they have taken, um, uh, have a whole plan for how to work with safety in the built environment. Other municipalities have worked with incorporating it in like a policy for um, housing that you have to focus on uh, situational crime prevention, uh, but also they mention even like our new handbook Boot uh, 2030. Uh, we see that there are municipalities which lift it even to like the um, overall uh, regional plans for the municipality, where they focus also on the importance of the built environment uh, connected to crime prevention and feelings of safety. Or when it comes to new uh, developments, municipalities are looking at current situations, how does the physical environment um, affect feelings of safety and how does the new development then uh, deal with this? Does it get improved or not? Um, but these are just a few examples and the most of the municipalities do not have it yet uh, so clearly written out. And it often, as in at national level, falls into the category of social sustainability. 
which makes it difficult to work with it practically or in detail. Um, on the other hand, at the national level, as uh, uh, Marike and Magnus also talked about, uh, the focus has been more and more on lifting the situational perspective. Uh, the government's program has um, recommended our handbook to, or our concept to be used when it comes to crime prevention. The last year's reviews, both from at the government level and at the National Council for Crime Prevention, they also put up that there's been a lot of work done on trying to work with uh, SEPTED in Sweden. Uh, maybe not exactly the term SEPTED, but in different ways. Uh, but once again, the evaluation and the follow up is lacking uh, locally. Um, so when it comes to these kind of programs, um, uh, the Swedish government has um, created the, these national programs like uh, four years ago. There was one, but also uh, uh, well, some decade ago, there was the other one. Uh, and we can see similar processes happening there. Uh, and in this process is also our concept, uh, uh, which was actually first developed in the year 2001 from the Stockholm police. Uh, where they looked at the Danish standards, which they developed quite early on. And they also looked at uh, the Netherlands, where they have the police certification, uh, as well as in the UK, where they have secured by design, of course. Um, but that was from a request from the police to be working a bit more like with situational crime prevention and a bit more proactive. Uh, we have taken over this concept in 2016 and developed it. It was outdated, it was not really usable, it was just a, a, a handbook with checklists. And right now we work a bit differently when it comes to urban planning. Um, so we have basically renewed this concept, um, but also updated it according to the daily planning uh, vision, so to say. Because Boot looked to, uh, from the year 2005, was focused on just housing and uh, housing areas. We have lifted it to a focus on um, interactions between different functions in the city or in the urban environment at all, as well as the public uh, space. We have also tried to uh, make it a bit more user friendly by illustrating it more, making it um, according to different categories, as uh, we will see later on. Um, and we have also changed the name a bit uh, to not include the year that it was uh, released, but to have this future perspective that we are still developing it, which we will do now. We are digitalizing it and making a digital tool of it. Um, and what we have done here is to actually create national guidelines for how we can plan and how we can actually uh, create the best um, yeah, possibilities for environments to be safe, uh, uh, to be secure and safe in the future. And we have done this in cooperation with a lot of different actors, of which you can see on this slide here. Uh, but they have been everything from um, big building companies as Skanska, which are well known worldwide, uh, to um, housing companies, both municipal, but also private investors. Um, um, as for instance, uh, uh, Rick Semicano, um, but we've also worked with more commercial uh, actors as Vasa Kronan, uh, but also Ica Fasigator, which run the uh, obviously Ica shops, um, but also like the smaller companies. We have been taking, uh, we have been using the knowledge from uh, municipalities as well in this process, as well as some architecture companies. Um, and some branch organizations as the, uh, what is it, like the Swedish insurance branch organization or something like that. Um, so we have taken a lot of perspectives in developing these national guidelines. And it has been a lot of discussions during those three years that we've been working with it on how we should write the guidelines, basically, um, how, we, how they can be implemented, how they can be used. And this has resulted now in this handbook that we have. Uh, we've also, during the time, worked with these companies or these actors, municipalities and companies, by trying to look locally at different pilot projects, trying to implement what we um, had already during the process, trying to work with those guidelines and principles, uh, which gave us good feedback in how to develop it further on. And this is something we will continue to do as well. The handbook itself consists of two parts. 
it um, first describes in general theories, describes septet, uh, describes the planning process in Sweden and how different perspectives can come in at different levels, different stages from municipal overall planning to like the detailed plans to writing the, uh, uh, the, the, the drawings for buildings, etc. And then the second part, which is the, con the specific you know, checklists or those guidelines, which we have divided up in the different aspects. Um, and this is how it looks inside. Well illustrated, the guidelines have each um, their own color according to each aspect that they are looking at. And here we are looking at our uh, yeah, model, which consists of eight main aspects then, uh, from urban planning to that, for instance, a mix of functions to uh, that there should be a, a clarity at the space, like orientation, uh, that there should be social control, lighting, there should be... Uh, um, target hardening if needed, um, there should be, um, uh, you should think about the uh, future uh, maintenance of a place as well as information and communication. Uh, so we have different guidelines under each of these aspects which form like a checklist for each of the aspects. And as you can see here also, for each guideline, we have also marked in which uh, planning phase it is actually uh, useful. So in which, it, uh, which stage of the planning process one can use the guideline. Some come in uh, in all the guidelines, some are only uh, uh, relevant for a certain guidelines, so to say. Um, so how does this work then in practical? Um, first of all, it can be said that we work in just through the whole process basically, because we are coming in at the planning stage where we, for instance, are analyzing detailed plans, uh, but we are also uh, part of the production phase where we work with the building companies. For instance, we have worked with the Skanska and went to their building sites and did some um, visits or analysis on how they can improve the safety or feelings of safety at the specific site. As well as we are later on part of the usage of the place uh, where we work together, for instance, as was mentioned already with the business improvement districts, um, but also with analyzing places and following up uh, a few times. Um, and as a result of that, we both um, analyze the uh, um, then places right now, uh, in which we then, according to our model, which you see to the left there, can mark different aspects which are relevant to focus on and have to be improved right now, as well as lift uh, things that are yeah good at the place at the moment, uh, where we can uh, where we look at social control, where we look at um, the orientation of the place, if it's easy to navigate, for instance. Uh, but we also look overall at the planning of the area, which is the urban planning, uh, the top one called the uh, Staltning in Swedish, um, where we look at how different functions are located and how they interact, or how's the relation between different places in an area, which is quite a big part of the Bootrick Handbook. Um, and then, as said, at the local level, we help actors, uh, yeah, municipalities, we help. Uh, private investors, private development companies, architects, uh, in the process of writing up uh, new plans, writing up detailed plans, where we uh, basically analyze the plans according to those guidelines that we have and give our feedback, which gives them a very useful report on what to focus on to improve the plans, but also focus on in the next phases of the planning process. Um, so there we yeah, basically go through the uh, guidelines and give them feedback according to that. Um, so that was a bit the description of um, uh, both our handbook in short, what it is about, uh, but also how we work with it locally. Thank you, Cornelis. Excellent. Um, and thank you so much for so neatly integrating um, basically your responses to the question uh, posed by Christine, our <laughs> crime prevention measure, measure is part of the zoning for building code in Sweden. So uh, your presentation was largely on that. Uh, something that our um, uh, participants are interested in is whether this handbook is available in English as well as the um, uh, the other one uh, that Marika has uh, talked about, uh, the school one. So are they available in English and where could our participants um, find them? So, mm, the, 
Bootrukt uh, Living Safe Handbook is uh, not yet available in English, unfortunately. Um, it would be very nice to uh, translate it somehow, of course, but uh, we haven't had time to do that yet. It was released last, yeah, April last year. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, the participants can find the booklet on your website if they wish to um, find it. Is that correct? It's on your um, uh, at the moment, we are we are digitalizing it, mm -hmm. so it, there, it's not like available digitally. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. So it's yeah, it can, it can be ordered online, but uh, it's in Swedish, so it might not be so useful yet. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> well, there are some translation tools that we can use until we get the English version. So uh, if we're impatient, but yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you so much, Cornelius. Um, we were kind of short on time, so I do want to make sure that we have enough time for questions. Um, I would like to launch our last poll. So if every, all the participants could maybe vote on this one before we move to the Q&A uh, session and we have some good questions waiting for us. So please, if you could um, answer how common are nonprofit organizations working with ZEPTED in your country where you operate? And that might be actually a good starting point for our discussion. So the responses are coming in. So, yeah, we'll give it a couple more seconds. Okay, so, okay, I will end the poll now and we'll share the results with you. Um, so it looks like the not so common response is the most frequent. So 70% said um, those kind of organizations are not common in their country um, and non-existent 22%. So what say you? <laughs> um, and that can go to all the panelists if you'd like to comment on that. Are you surprised by that response? Well, I am quite, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I thought it should have been more in many countries, more uh, cooperation with NGOs as uh, say for Sweden Foundation. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised of the results. But at the same time, we don't really have another organization that works as we do in Sweden, Magnus. So I, I'm not really surprised. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, it, yeah. But uh, at the same time, we, we see that um, many other countries are uh, ahead of us. Uh, so maybe that, yeah. Well, there's, there's still, so you're saying there's still room for improvement, yes? <laughs> so we'll, we'll work towards that. Okay. Um, Okay, Francesc had to go, unfortunately. Okay, let's actually look at um, the budgeting because I think, and funding of the NGOs, because I think that's, um, that was a question that we also got um, during registration. So uh, Terence, hi Terence, uh, he joins us from Australia. So uh, thank you for being here. So Terence Love asks, how is crime prevention um, like NGOs in Sweden funded? Uh, is it by gifting, charity, government funding, payments for services or other pathways? So you could maybe, maybe Magnus. Yeah, well, I should say that most NGOs um, uh, working with other topics than we do, they are government funding. But we uh, made a point when we were established in 2008 not to take government funding because we want to, we don't want to be a part of, of, of the government. So uh, we want to be free. So uh, we work together with different companies instead uh, with the corporate social responsibility and also work with nonprofit uh, consulting work. So that's how we are founding, founded. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that you, um... You write proposals and you submit those proposals in order to also get funding and so on, or well, maybe just to. Mm -hmm. well, most of the time, we work with different companies that want to, property owners, for example, that want to, to uh, work in new ways with new ideas. Uh, 
Uh, so we don't take uh, money from the government or from the municipality, but we do help them to develop their work as a, a consulting uh, company, but we are a nonprofit. So, mm -hmm. so also, yeah, that's how we are founded. About uh, 10 million Swedish crowns uh, every year. Mm -hmm. So though money those profit. partners find you then it seems yeah. they contact you because well yeah. they contact us and we sometimes contact them if we see that uh, they are maybe are building uh, a new area then uh, Cornelis contacts them to, to see if they're interesting to 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 do it right from the beginning or mm -hmm. so that's that sounds mm -hmm. Okay, um, maybe just a quick follow up very briefly. Terence also asks, could you maybe say a bit more about corporate social responsibility? Because you mentioned that. Yeah, um, when we were, when we started in 2008, uh, this uh, CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility started to grow strong in, in Sweden. So we thought that uh, Swedish companies, Swedish businesses should see the value of an uh, independent think tank, an independent NGO that tried to, to, to see what um, could be done to prevent uh, uh, crime and, and to, to support crime victims. But uh, to be honest, for the last uh, 13 years, uh, it has been hard to, to work with Swedish companies uh, from a CSR point of view. Uh, Swedish companies do work with CSR, but it's still a lot of um, um, uh, focus on other questions in other countries. So uh, we are st still struggling to to try to work with Swedish companies from a safety and security point of view in Sweden. So for our founding for 10 million Swedish crowns each year, about 2 million, 2, 3 million comes from this kind of CSR uh, collaborations with, with companies and the rest of the money we, we work in uh, with, uh, m when we work for municipalities and for companies as a consulting company. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There's, I hope that um, answers your question. Okay, let's, um, I think this will be mainly for Marika. Um, so there was first a question about uh, whether um, your Safe Schools booklet can, is um, also available in English and where maybe uh, the participants can find it. Uh, so maybe let's start with that and then maybe to- um, It's not available in English yet, but it would be fun to collaborate with someone to translate it to English. So we're open for it, but it's not available in English yet. Mm -hmm. But if someone has any questions about it, you can write to me and mm -hmm. I can describe it more in detail. What's it about? Excellent, thank you. Okay, but, uh, then, Mattia, yeah, sorry. And Marika, but we do have uh, one important uh, uh, publication in English and that's uh, about the public bathrooms. Maybe you could say something about that, Marika. Mm. Oh yeah, we also have a network focusing on women's uh, safety and liberty in public space. So I and Cornelius work with that network. And within that network, we wanted to focus on public restrooms because that kind of that's kind of an overlooked function in the public space. Uh, so we uh, wrote a report on that, uh, and that report is available in English. So I, maybe I can send mm -hmm. the link afterwards. Great. Yes, please. So you can put it in a chat box actually toward the participants as well, if uh, if that's okay. Uh, but Marika, since you already kind of segued into kind of the gender um, lens, could you maybe? answer the question about the gender lens um, in relation to the audit tools that are available and maybe if you have an example so I suspect that maybe a safety audit and how you know the do you actually conduct safety audits with females in particular environments including toilet type environments yeah so the report on public uh, restrooms have uh, like a checklist of what a public restrooms sh uh, restroom should have from a gender sensitive perspective. 
Um, so that's one example, I think. But otherwise, it's more or less about gathering information from both sexes, I think, having a representative process, like I mentioned before. Uh, so there are some tools to actually do that. So when we work with public spaces, for example, we count how we count the people who use as a public space. And also in school, we do the same. So we count the people and we also divide them uh, via, the, via the sex. Uh, so depending on which sex the person have, uh, we count it. And usually we see then that uh, men, men occupies the public space during evenings and women disappears during, during evenings and also children, which is more obvious, but it, it, it's still interesting. Uh, and also another, um, another interesting tool that I could share with you is gender budgeting, where Vienna is actually a very good uh, example uh, of that. So every year when they do their budget, they work with a gender budgeting system. So uh, when they divide the resources, for example, let's say that a sports facility gets some kind of part of the budget, then that sport facility need to count the people who use that sport facility. And maybe they see that 90% of the men use the sport facility and only 10% women. Uh, then that's a foundation for the budget system next year. And then you can question why that sport facility gets so much money when it only reaches or are being used by a portion of the um, inhabitants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just speaks to the importance of actually knowing what's happening on the ground and going there and investigating, right, before you make the decision. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Okay, maybe one quick question to um, respond to Francesc's question about uh, how is your rapport with schools and how do you organize your cooperation with them? Marika, that's also for you and then oh. I have a question for Cornelis, sorry. <laughs> so I would say that is kind of a challenge to start collaborating with schools in Sweden. And there are a number of reasons for that. So one reason is that school, the school system in Sweden has changed the last years. So now schools, it's more important for the school to protect their brand because otherwise student will leave, students will leave the school, the students won't choose that school and then the school will, will close. So schools need to protect their brand. So when it comes to us, since what we do, is look at the whole organization. So when we are finished with our work, it means that the school needs to change things on a ground level. Uh, so that means that it can be hard to initiate these kind of collaborations unless the situation is in that kind of bad state. So everybody in the municipality might know about it and then they turn towards us to get help to show that they want to change. So it's not, not as easy to work with us, I would say, uh, compared to, for example, hire someone to come in and give a lecture about men's violence towards women. And then you, they can write that in their plan and say, we did this. So it's a whole other situation for us. So I would say that it's kind of difficult. But what happens is that uh, often we don't go to specific schools, but a municipality reaches out for us because they are responsible for the schools in their municipality. So we have, so far, we have only worked with public schools and not private schools, which can also be related probably, I think, with the brand situation. But anyways, the municipalities reach, reaches out to us and say that they want to uh, work with a specific project. And then we uh, work in that way. So we go through the head of the school so to speak. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Okay, I know we're basically out of time, but I do want to spend a few more minutes if that's okay. If uh, people have to go, uh, please uh, leave. But are, are you panelists okay to stay another three to five minutes? <laughs> yeah? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, one question for Cornelis, uh, because I think that might be interesting. So uh, what is the role of the NGO in actualizing accepted principles in built environments? So Cornelis, since this is your area, maybe you could answer that one. Uh, so what is our role in mm -hmm. Sweden? Um, I think it, it can be a lot basically, but um, uh, in the end, I think for when it comes to the built environment, it is mainly about like, yeah, 
showing proof that it really uh, is effective to do something right from the beginning instead of working with a lot uh, putting a lot of money on the management later on and trying to change structures um so that i think that's one of the main roles that we have trying to you know, put on the right glasses so to say for the different actors there and that's also i think in the end the main aim of the ma even if we have those more like consultancy assignments uh, where we write reports on for instance different detail plans or where we analyze things in the end it is to um yeah show what can be done um in a rather easy way so to say we're still giving a good result or a, a, a large effect in the end um so yeah for for for, for from a swedish perspective it's a lot about creating or <laughs> handing out, so to say, more knowledge and uh, giving people tools to work with it locally. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, now, maybe just briefly, I will ask every, um, all th our three panelists to um, say something um, for conclusion. So what are maybe some key elements for running a successful NGO? and maybe some takeaways. So if I could ask each of you to maybe uh, go very briefly, so we can start with you, Magnus. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. And I will uh, uh, be short. Uh, well, at least in our country, it uh, has been uh, important for us as an NGO to, to have this dialogues with politicians and practitioners uh, and, and uh, in, in different branches because uh, CEPTED has not um, been an important topic. Uh, it has been overlooked uh, in the process. So uh, for us an, as an NGO, uh, we have had an important role both locally and on a national level when it comes to enhance the importance of SEPTED. So, so, well, that's one answer at least, why it's important to work with an NGO. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Magnus. Rika? Thank, uh, unmute, please. Can you repeat the question? Sure. Um, yeah, so I ask like, what are some key elements of running a successful NGO and maybe some key takeaways for our listeners today? Um, I think for us, something that is very important for us is independency. Uh, and that's something that can be quite tricky since we work in these local projects. So we don't only work on a national level. So we need to guard our independency and at the same time be good at collaborating with other people. So, for example, when I work with schools, I evaluate their work, but it's, I need to show that it's for their sake, so to speak and also guard my independence. So I think that's the key elements that I want to lift up in this context. Thank you, Erika. And Cornelis, a few words from you, please. Uh, one of the success factors. <laughs> um, there are a lot of challenges, I would say, especially uh, as Marika mentioned, this balance between different things. <laughs> uh, but in the end, I think it's about persistence uh, stay put. Uh, uh, yeah, make your voice heard, so to say. We have, we publish a lot of uh, articles in newspapers, write those, all those reports that we have talked about right now, which is like, uh, yeah, basically a non-funded NGO uh, activity, but they really give a lot of, uh, how do you call it, uh, publicity to us. Uh, but also give legitimacy to local actors, for instance, private developers, to work with SEPTED. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I do want to emphasize the role of NGOs as civic society representative, basically, it's so important, right? Um, and we do encourage that, um, yeah, the individual countries consider um, a greater role of their NGOs as well. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, we're sorry that we couldn't answer all of your questions. Maybe we can ask um, the panelists if uh, they have the time maybe to uh, briefly uh, respond to some of them that are still there. 
Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we may want to actually have you back as well for a follow up. Maybe that might be an interesting topic considering there was great interest. Uh, so I want to th thank everyone for their um, attendance today. I want to really sincerely thank our panelists today as well. Uh, we're very proud to have you as an ICA chapter <laughs> in our real family. So um, thank you so much for taking the time for answering questions and for presenting uh, your work to the wider audience. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I will ask uh, Manjari to uh, conclude with a, a couple of announcements and uh, then we're, uh, we wish you a safe and uh, successful rest of the day. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have another webinar coming up uh, uh, in another couple, uh, in another about uh, 10 days time uh, about community engagement through SEPTED in times of uncertainty. And I would request uh, all our viewers and our speakers to join us that day. Thank you very much to the speakers once again for a very, very interesting and a very uh, uh, engaging conversation, uh, a very engaging discussion. Uh, we also invite all of you to please uh, join us if you are not members of the ICA yet. Please become a part of our community and join us in all our efforts. We invite the participants to also learn about our individual certification program for separate professionals called ICCP. You can know, know more about it at the web link given on your screen. Uh, similarly, we also have a course accreditation program for uh, separate course de developers in your own uh, areas, regions, and focus areas. Uh, you could uh, again look this up on our website. Um, as per the link given on your screen. Uh, we are, we will be very happy if you could follow us and engage with us on social media. We are on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Thank you once again to all our viewers from across the world. Thank you once again to our esteemed panelists. And uh, please join us and stay connected with the ICA. We are concluding this session now. And uh, you, uh, for, we might be having further engagements on the end topic of NGOs. I believe there were some questions regarding developing countries. We will be happy to take them up in further sessions. Otherwise, you can always write in to us, to our directors at ICA. Thank you very much and have a safe day.